Okay, so we were here and we were talking about how a cascade takes place, how a ligand comes in into the receptor, activates a G protein, the G protein activates an enzyme, which is a second messenger in this whole play. The first messenger is obviously the ligand itself because it's coming and giving the message. The second messenger is this one because it's turning on many enzymes that turn on other enzymes and eventually lead to a cascade that is amplified at each stage. Moving on, we're talking about the different processes of diffu the, uh, that occur within a cell, how contents enter the cell membrane. We've talked about how it's a semi-permeable permeable membrane. So let's, and we've talked about what things will enter freely and what will not. So in things that will enter freely, we have something called diffusion that's taking place. Diffusion, as you must remember, is down the concentration, passive movement. Um, it occurs across the membrane, can be without a membrane as well. So if the concentration is higher here, it's definitely gonna move to a place where it is lower. What is facilitated diffusion? Like the word says, facilitated simply means it is a kind of diffusion that is facilitated by something. For instance, if you have particles here in high concentration and here in low concentration, they can't cross the cell membrane unless there is a port in here that's gonna let them do so. Because imagine large, very polar molecules over here. Now, how are they gonna cross over? They're gonna cro cross over um, through this, this, uh, this uh, channel. Now, this channel we've already talked about is a protein transport channel. Look at this channel, it has space for it to flow through. And in this channel, why is this called facilitated diffusion? Because the principles are exactly the same, high to low concentration, no use of energy. The only difference is it is facilitated by a channel. Now, what are the factors that affect these two processes? One of the factors is concentration gradient. That makes sense, we've been doing it since Olaval. Temperature is a factor. Temperature gives molecules kinetic energy to move faster. Surface area is a factor. Now, this is a very important factor, and this comes up in your practical assignments. And today's task is also going to be related to it. I want all of you to perform a task at the end of this topic just to make sure that you're actively engaged in this topic. <clears throat> the more the surface area, the more likely, see, the more the surface area, there is a high chance of more particles coming in touch with the thing itself. And when they come in touch, they have a high chance of diffusing in itself, right? So surface area is an important factor. And then there are properties of the molecule. For instance, if there is a molecule that weighs 120 kilos, it's gonna take a lot of time to move in rather than a molecule that weighs only 20 kilos. So property of the molecule. If there is a molecule that is very small and non-polar, it's gonna take less time to cross this membrane as compared to a larger molecule or even let's say a smaller molecule, but it is polar. So the property of the molecule is different and that property determines how it's gonna move in. We've already talked about that as well. So just apply those simple rules on these definitions. And then number of proteins. And that counts when you're talking about facilitated diffusion because this diffusion takes place through these channels. So for these channels to work, we need specific proteins called uh, uh, these transport proteins or integral membrane protein. And the number of these will highly determine if the process occurs fast or at a slower rate. Okay, so let's see, um, there's another example. Uh, now this example is for instance, let's say for our facilitated diffusion. But what is being shown here is how protein channels can be different. How the protein uh, molecules, uh, especially the ones with the gates or with ports in them are different. So essentially there are two types of protein molecules that you need to learn at this level. A channel protein or a carrier protein. A channel protein, like the word says, is a channel. It has a channel in it. It's just um, a circular cylindrical opening. Anything can pass through if it's open. If it's closed, nothing will pass through. A carrier protein, on the other hand, has specific shapes. For instance, this molecule will fit into the shape of the carrier and be carried through. Now, once if, and it can be carried through both ways. Similarly, flow here can occur both ways as well, which is why this is phys <coughs> facilitated diffusion. Diffusion itself means that it can occur both ways depending on concentrations, right? So over here in a carrier protein, this molecule, similarly as it is over here, this when the molecule comes in on one side, it makes the other side close. This 
protein molecule will recognize that the molecule coming in is correct and then open on the other side to release it. Similarly, if once it is being, uh, once it is inside, no molecule can enter from either side. So carrier protein has specific shape changes depending on uh, how the molecule is, whether it's inside or whether it's not inside. So th there are specific ch changes. Look at this one. Look at the change going from this way to this way. It's going to make it very easy to understand. And so channel proteins, you can imagine, are really easy. They're just channels. Anything can pass through lots of sodium, lots of potassium. Carrier proteins can be specific. And one specific kind that we're going to talk about is Wait, I have it. Okay. One specific kind of carrier protein is this one. Now with carrier proteins and channel proteins, let me just give you one, tell you one thing here. With carrier and channel proteins, facilitated diffusion will occur. And so can something we call active transport. If you remember active transport from your O levels, you know active transport needs energy. So if a carrier protein has the need of an ATP, then that carrier protein is performing active transport. But if it does not need an ATP, if it only has free ports, then it is facilitated diffusion because then you don't need to perform uh, to, to give it any energy. It just needs to recognize the particle. So that's, that's it for now. And we'll be talking about that pump later on in the presentation. <clears throat> Okay, I told you guys the next lecture is going to be a lot about how your paper three works, right? The practical presentation works. So an example of this is given here. Now this is to check diffusion and it's a very easy experiment. What you do is you need to check the rate of diffusion over time, right? And for rates, if you remember, we just draw those simple graphs for rate. Now at this point, you should be able to recognize that rate is always time, right? So in a graph of rate, what you do is you put time on the x-axis and time always comes on the x-axis. Why does time come on the x-axis? Because you cannot modify time ever. Y-axis is the quantity that, in a graph and x-axis is always the quantity that you cannot be modified and a y-axis is the quantity that can be modified. So time and, and when we're talking about rate, for instance, I want to check diffusion uh, of one molecule as compared to another, a molecule called A as compared to another. Now, how am I going to check diffusion? I'm obviously going to check the rate of diffusion because the rates are what makes sense, right? But see if 20 molecules, how much time will it take for 20 molecules of A to pass through a shield as compared to 20 molecules of B? And that is simply the experiment here. And the y-axis is always, for instance, whatever you are sampling here. So for practical purposes, for every paper three, what you need to remember here, in the first one of the lecture, I taught you how to make drawings and microscopy. This one, I need to you, I need you to know how to make graphs. So for a graph, it is important to recognize what you're going to be measuring. You're going to be measuring rates. How are you going to be measuring them? That comes in here on the experiment that we're going to talk about. And then this y value is always what you are sampling, right? So what we're essentially doing is very simple. I'm going to use a beaker and put distilled water into it. Then I'm going to take a whisking bag. A whisking bag is just, just something that resembles a cell surface membrane. It's a, it's a single bag. I'm going to tie it in both ends after filling it with something um, that I'm going to sample, right? Or something that I, I, I'm going to use for diffusion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put A in here and another bag of B in here. Okay, now what am I putting in here? For instance, I put in starch and amylase A in, in this bag. And then for another in another bag, I put in starch and amylase B. Now the experiment is very simple. Starch is a large molecule. It cannot cross over outside of the whisking tube, right? But on the other hand, what amylase is going to do, our amylase is going to break this starch down into smaller glucose molecules that can for in this whisking tubing is a special membrane out of which they can move out right diffusion can take place now what's the next step it's very easy you just need to use a pipette to sample a little bit of water from here draw out a little bit of water using a pipette and sample this water check and how are you going to check that water you already know that if there's glucose in a substance, you can check the level of glucose by doing a Benedict's test. So what you're simply simply doing is, for instance, at zero minutes, you took one sample over here. That sample, before putting the whisking tube inside or immediately putting it inside, at that point, nothing has diffused out, right? So the reaction is going to be at zero. So you have your first X planted here. At 30 seconds, 
at, at 30 seconds, you took out another sample. Now that sample shows a red colored Benedict test. Sample shows a red colored Benedict test. And you say, oh, for instance, at the next 30 seconds, my, and th this is a scale. Now what, what's your scale gonna be? Colors, for instance, this is gonna be red color, orange, yellow, green, blue, the whole range, right? So you say, okay, this was red. And then after 60 seconds, you see, okay, it's orange. Now it's orange. And so that way you're gonna draw a whole graph and then you're gonna sketch a line in the graph. And then you're gonna say, okay, over time, the rate of diffusion decreased because what we, I noticed was that initially the colors were sharp, but then the colors faded down. The opposite can be done with the whisking tube. For instance, after every few times, you open the thread and take a sample out of the whisking tube. Now you can test, now you know this has starch in it, so you can test for starch. You can do an iodine test to check whether the amount of starch is increasing or decreasing, but a better test and or whether more is, more is left inside or less is left inside, but a better test would be to do sample the, the, this from the outside and draw a graph of it or to sample the concentration using a colorimeter remember if benedict tests look looks difficult to explain you can just simply write i'm going to use a colorimeter to check the concentration that uh, that is present in this tube after this second and this second and this second and at one point the concentration will become constant because when all of the amylase, amylase breaks down glucose uh, starch into glucose then the, when the glucose here is equal to the glucose here the concentration becomes constant so that's how you go about explaining these um, uh, these experiments. They're very simple. When we move on to the experiment uh, paper three, you'll see that they're not as difficult to do as this here. Just one point here. There are two lines that are always necessary to put in when you're talking about experiment. The first line is that you always, always want to use a control. And I've talked about controls when we were doing MCQs. What is a control? It's just nothing. If you're using Benedict, to test this sample, then you want to use Benedict to test normal distilled water. Why do you want to do it? Because you want to make sure that the color of the Benedict does not change on water. It just change on that solution, right? And so initially, you're going to take a control right out of this beaker, not from another beaker, because what if there was something stuck to this beaker that, that changed something in the distilled water? And so the Benedicts will Benedict for this distilled water and another distilled water is different. So what you do is the first sample you take is from this distilled water, you perform the Benedict test on it, and then you say, okay, so now I've checked my control, it comes out blue, which means I can proceed with taking samples at 0, 30, 60, and so on seconds. And the second thing is always we need randomization. To do that, we need to increase the number of samples. You take three to five measurements of the same experiment and use an average. Even if you don't perform this step because you don't have as much time, but you have to write it down when you're designing an experiment. So I hope designing experiments is clear. Even if it isn't, understanding a little bit of the important parts at this point is really more important than understanding what you are doing. You'll be able to do that once you start doing experiments and start reading paper threes. But for now, you need to know a few points of what you want to do. What kind of graphs do you want to write about? So that's what's important. Is it is it clear for now? Yeah, Miss. Okay, so let's move on with our actual topic. So we did diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Let's go on with osmosis. Now, if, if we remember osmosis, what was osmosis? It was the movement down a concentration gradient passively of water molecules across a membrane. And it was only water molecules. So if I put a membrane here, it's and water molecules move across it, then it's diffusion. If I remove this molecule, if I remove this membrane and then water molecules move across it, will it be, uh, will, sorry, if I put the membrane here, it will be osmosis. If I remove this membrane and the water molecules, because they're more here and they're less here, move across, will it be osmosis? No, it's going to be simple diffusion. For osmosis, all the terms of diffusion have to come in and two additional terms. The first term is it, it's only for water. And the second term is across a partially permeable membrane. Now this membrane cannot let solute pass through. And when it doesn't let solute pass through, this membrane will only let water pass through, which means it's a good experiment for osmosis. 
And now what we'll see is in a in 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 a in sample A where water is more and B where water is less, what ends up happening is due to osmosis, water where it is more moves into a place where it is less, and so the water level of B will rise until the concentration because these are concentration gradients until the concentration here is equal to the concentration here. And what is going to determine that? The amount of salute, as you can see, more salute here means that it is highly concentrated. To reduce this concentration, you want water to move in and reduce its concentration. So very simple. If there's any questions, feel free to ask. Okay. Now, and the second thing to understand in osmosis, and that is a little higher above the level of O level, is that osmosis is dependent upon something called a water potential. So over here, let me tell you now, over here, um, the, so potential means ability. And water potential is the ability of water to move. So when a water moves from a solution, and so when it has the power to move, it is called potential. Now, always remember that pure deionized water has a potential of zero. And a positive potential means water can move from that area, water can move. For instance, if I say water, water is more here in concentration, this one has a higher concentration and higher potential, which is why it moves from area of high potential to area of low potential, just like our definition. And this is a fact that pure water is at zero potential. Then whenever you add ions or make a solution, the potential becomes negative. So if you put a solution with ionized water, where is, where is the water going to move? It's going to move from a higher potential, that is zero, towards the solution, which is negative potential. If you make a solution with three particles as compared to 10 particles, Wherever there are more solute, solutes, it's going to be more negative. And water always moves from higher, higher potential to lower potential. And so it's going to move from location of, um, a, 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 for instance, if this is negative 3 and this is negative 20, it's going to move from negative 3 into negative 20. For now, just ignore this plunger. If I'm not putting in a plunger, I'm just putting in this like this. So what's going to happen eventually is that water is always going to move from a lower negative value to a higher negative value because of water potential. Now, we've talked about how solutes make water more negatively, more negative, with the, make water have a more negative potential. Putting water under pressure gives it a more positive water potential. So that is what this plunger represents here. In a normal solution, initially what was happening was that in this solution, we saw that now it's evenly distributed. And this water shouldn't, even if it's a, even when we're talking about concentrate movement in the concentration gradient, the definition will always say net movement. Net movement, what does net movement mean? It means at any point in time, some movement from here to here and some from here to here will be taking place. There can never be zero movement. There's just the fact that movement from here to here is greater, which is why the water level of this has rose. But do you think if this is randomly placed here, will this water level go back down? No, it won't because now it's balanced out. The net movement is balanced out. Over here, the net movement was towards the left side, but over here, the net movement is balanced out. So what happens here? Over here, what you do is, now the, these are two, A and B are two solutions at the same water potential. You put in through a plunger pressure on B. So you elevate the water potential of B. Just like I told you, water under pressure has a positive water potential. Now this positively charged water potential will force it into the negative charge. And so if you keep pushing on the plunger, it, it's going to equal out again. And that's as simple as that. And, you know, MCUs will come in and you guys will get confused, but just don't get confused. Remember this trick. Pure water, always zero. Any solutes are added, negative. Pressure is added, positive. And movement will always occur from high pressure, high water potential to low water potential. So just these three rules and you're good to go. So is that clear?
Yeah, miss. Okay. So now this is revision four-level. Do you recognize these diagrams? Do they recognize? I still remember Olival has this very detailed um, definitions on hypertonic and hypotonic solutions. So hypertometer, hypertonic solutions, solutions again, just like water potential, hypertonic solutions are solutions with more concentration of solute and hypotonic with less concentration of solute. These diagrams in Olival were just uh, there to make you guys realize the direction of movement of water of the direction of movement of osmosis and then what happens to the cell itself for instance in a same solution as the red cell which is 0.7 to 0.9 percent nacl it's gonna remain normal but if i put this if this if i put a red blood cell in a very dilute solution which is also a hypotonic solution which means the tonic or the solute is hypo it's very less what's going to happen as compared to that what is inside. So hypotonic and hypertonic are always comparative terms for two, uh, two fluids put against each other in osmosis across a membrane. So in a hypotonic, if this solution is hypotonic compared to the red blood cell, what's going to happen? Water, osmosis inside. So much water goes inside that the cell membrane that was very thin will burst. Similarly, in a placed in a hypertonic solution as compared to the red blood cell, all the water moves outside and the cell shrinks or forms spikes called crenation. So just remember the word crenation and you'd be good to go. <clears throat> okay, so now looking at the plant cell, now this diagram is important for you guys to remember because you can see in a hypotonic solution, the cell membrane is so important because it helps the cell keep its shape, does not let the cell membrane stretch extra and burst. And it's there to make it something called turgid. It makes the plant turgid because the plant does not have an endoskeleton like we do. It has a relatively exoskeleton. So this turgidity becomes really important physiologically that it gives the, gives the plant its shape or let's say it keep, keeps the plant upright. In a solution where the water potential is uh, with the water uh, with the water potential inside the cell is really high and outside is a hypertonic solution the water is going to move out leading to the cell shrinking just like this but when this cell shrinks what happens is the cell membrane keep, cell wall keeps its shape just like here so the cell wall sticks outside but the insides move inside and it's there's something called plasma uh, this there's something called plasmolysis or plasmolysis which uh, which is basically cell moving in. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of it uh, as well on a slide. So look at this one. Look at the cell wall. The cell walls are right there, but the entire cell has shrunken and become this blob inside. You can't even appreciate the nucleus anymore. It's a red onion cell. You can see the pigmentation is red because of the red onion pig internal pigmentation. You can appreciate that the cell, mem cell walls are intact, but the cell membrane has plasmolyzed and shrunken so much because of the loss of water. So um, that is what uh, this essentially is. Um, what is incipient plasmolysis? It is the point when the plasmolysis is about to occur. So simply, it's the point, it's when the cell, so it's when the cell is in this shape, but one second after, it's going to become this. The difference between this to this in this solution, the, the point at which plasmolysis is about to occur is incipient plasmolysis, which means incoming plasmolysis. Okay. So this is a question from your book, two neighboring plant cells. Cell A has a higher water potential. How do I know it has a higher water potential if it wasn't mentioned here? By looking at this water potential menu, uh, value. This W, this little W is used for water potential. This trident is used to show water potential. Um, so it says minus 250 and we know it's less negative, near to zero is high water potential. Um, this is minus 250, this is minus 400. So obviously, water is going to move from area from where it is in higher potential to where it is in much lower potential. It's going to move from A to B. Okay, 
The question is in which direction net movement will occur? Now let's see net movement. Because at any point, movement is occurring both ways. Net movement is from A to B. And the next question is explain what is by, meant by net movement. And if you understand what is occurring at every moment, just like I told you, net movement is the overall movement that is occurring. And for this B part, I want you to go back and Google this as well. Please write it down as a task because I want you to be able to write it down perfectly. So then he's asking for an explanation to A. You know the explanation. You can talk about this. You can mention the minus 250 and the minus 400 and movement down a gradient. So then he's asking about placing them in pure water, which is, so pure water has nothing in it and a very high water potential of zero. What's going to happen? All the water is going to enter inside. Is this cell going to burst? Not at all, because they have cell walls. They're going to become extremely turgid. And if I put an, in, it in a sucrose solution with a lower water potential than either cell, then what's going to happen? All the water is going to move outside and it's going to become plasmolized. Both of them will become plasmolized. So that's, I hope this question is easily understood. If it is, then you've understood the whole topic and you'll be able to do the past papers really well. Okay. Then finally, the process come being compared. So look at this, passive transports, diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, active transport, <coughs> opposite trans, look at the opposite gradient, higher movement from a low gradient to a higher gradient using energy and using this pump. Excuse me. Okay, and it's using this pump. Can you see, look at this pump. Both of these pumps are similar just here. This is down the concentration gradient. This is against the concentration gradient. No ATP, ATP required by the pump. An example of active transport is the sodium potassium pump. Now you need to understand the sodium potassium pump. What happens in a sodium potassium pump is on the inside, three sodiums bind on the pump then an ATP has to come in. This is occurring intracellularly. This ATP reverts the shape of this molecule to close from the inside and open from the other side. When it opens from the other side, the sodium can then leave. And then this pump stays this way. Then what happens is that until or unless two potassiums come in, this ATP is not removed from here. So what happens is, the sodiums are relieved, the potassiums come in. When the potassium is attached, attach, then the phosphate leaves the pump and the pump changes its shape again to release the potassium inside. So the net movement is three sodium outside and two potassium inside of the membrane using, an eight, using one phosphate from an ATP molecule. So can you appreciate these four steps? Very easy steps. Just remember three sodium out, two potassium in, and the use of uh, the ATP phosphate. So the ATP itself you, gives its phosphate and these phosphate are what carry all the energy, not the ATP, the entirety of the ATP. Again, talking about the endocytosis and exocytosis, Look at this process, membrane folding in, endocytosis. Membrane fusing in and releasing stuff, exocytosis. If a liquid folds in, it's called pinocytosis, which is drinking of the cell in a way. Endocytosis can be, and then what is phagocytosis? It is solid stuff being endocytosed. It's called phagocytosis, especially when it has to be digested by the cell. Liquid stuff being taken in or endocytosed by the cell is pinocytosis. So remember, phago and pinocytosis. And exocytosis is just the release. Okay. Now, this is where I wanted you guys to do something on your own as well. So I'm just putting in a little bit of um, information for you guys. So look at the surface area to volume ratios here. So the surface area and volume formula are given here. In a table, what you, what you can see is that this one cube, look at this one cube, they found the surface area and volume. 
the surface area to volume ratio of this smaller cube is six ratio one. It's really high. And I told you if the surface area to volume ratio is high, there's going to be fast diffusion osmosis, whatever process it is. Now, this is opposite to normal thinking, but I want it to put it out to you guys that the smaller the particle, the, the larger the surface area to volume ratio. Look at, ignore the other values. Just remember this bar and these growths. The small, the larger it gets, the smaller the surface area to volume ratio becomes. The smaller the particle, the greater the surface area to volume ratio. This one has six by one. This one has three by one. This one has two by one. So just remember, smaller, greater surface area to volume ratio. And that is diffuse. Which one will have higher diffusion taking place? This one. If I put in, if the previous whisking tube was, let's say, this size, if I put in a whisking tube of this size, which one is going to have a faster graph or a steeper graph? This one, because diffusion is taking place quicker in the smaller one. Okay. And what I want you guys to do is try to understand surface area to volume ratios. So this is the link. Um, I'm going to send it. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it in the group. You, you have to go to this link and read up the investigation. And then on one page, you have to design the investigation yourself. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to this link, read it up, this investigation for surface area to volume ratio. And then you're going to make your own investigation that is a little bit different than the link and send it to me. And that investigation should have 10, 7 to 10 points of what you will be performing and what you will be recording. And this is your first step towards attempting a paper three. Um, have any of you ever done a paper three, um, a paper three experiment design question? Raid, have you done it? Because you've covered the syllabus. So have you done how to attempt a question in paper three when they ask you to design an experiment? Okay, so you've exempted it, so you're not going to give it, or are you going to give it eventually? Okay, okay, that makes sense. So the, the people who exempt it, I, in my time, they, they, there wasn't any option to exempt it, but people who exempt it, are you supposed to give ATPs or something like that, or you're just not going to give the exam? Miss, we have an option to exempt it. So did you exempt it? Because um, as far as I remember, you guys never told me you exempted it. Did you and did you exempt it too? No, not me. Okay, so then um, anybody who hasn't exempted it should perform it because I want you guys to be prepared for it as well. Okay, any questions in this topic? No, miss. 